Cool, just while we're waiting, um, we'll just do some quick introductions. Um, my name's Scott uh, and with me we've got Carl uh, and Louise. And we're all part of the client Hello. success team at, um, at SnapFi at Airtel. So if you've ever called through or sent tickets through, you may have dealt with one of us before. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to go through today is just some new recruiter training, um, just some basics of the system. If you have any questions, please do send them through on chat. We'll be monitoring that as we go. Uh, and we can either re respond to on there, or if it's relevant to bring up as part of the training, we can bring that up and kind of cover it for everybody. So please do feel free to um, put any questions you have through. Um, and otherwise, we'll hang around at the end for some questions as well if needed. Uh, we will also be sending out uh, a, um, a follow-up email on this with some additional resources and things like that, uh, as well as links to like uh, our YouTube channel, which has uh, some of our recorded training for new recruiter training, but also other webinar training sessions that we've had um, over the last year or so. Uh, so do check that out. Um, yeah, otherwise, let's, uh, let's maybe kick off. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Um, at any point, if I'm looking over there, I've got two, the old two screens set up, so I am still paying attention. Um, yeah, thanks for the intro, Scott. You pretty much covered the intro. Um, keen today to basically run through some of the basics around SnapHire um, and go through some you know, tips and tricks uh, for your daily use of the product um, to help you use it a little bit better and hopefully save you some more time. Um, if we do cover uh, anything and it looks quite different to your system or the way that SnapPy looks for your organization, um, just bear in mind that SnapPy is very permission-based. So uh, the, the demo site that we're going to be using today may look very different, um, but basically the functionality is, is yeah dependent on what settings you have. So if there is something that you see and you think, I don't understand that, or on the Converse, I actually really like that and we want that for our organization, uh, make a little note and we can have a conversation about that later or you can raise a ticket and we can look at uh, doing that for you. Um, but in terms of the basics today, what we're going to be covering is uh, basically general site navigation. So where things are on the site and what they do, um, job creation and posting, um, candidate applications um, and processing candidates through the system. So some of you may be familiar with that already. Um, some of you may be new to SnapHire, um, but basically just covering those basics. Um, to start with, as a little bit of a product overview, um, so at AATL, uh, we have two main software products. So we have SnapHire and we have the Talent App Store, which essentially powers the SnapHire marketplace. Um, so SnapHire, uh, as most of you probably know, um, it's our applicant tracking software. So it's designed for talent sourcing and acquisition. Um, the other product, the Talent App Store, basically uh, is our integration platform for allowing you to install apps onto your SnapHire software. So the Talent App Store powers the SnapHire marketplace, and that means that you can install different applications, you can install reference checking or psychometric tests, those kind of things. So we've basically taken all the hard work of the integration and made it a very easy on-off situation where you can go through and pick what applications you'd like to use in your SnapHire system. Um, I'll explain that a little bit later as we go through some of the tabs in SnapHire um, and the, the Talent App Store as well, so we will come back to that. Um, like I mentioned, SnapHire is very permission-based, um, so you will see different things depending on uh, what kind of user you are and what permissions you've been granted um, and what you can do in the system. So what actions you can raise, what parts of the system you can or can't see compared to other users. Um, so there's four main types of user within SnapHire. There's the recruiter user, which is probably most of you here today. Um, the recruiter user has a lot of permission within SnapHire. Um, and basically used for recruiting people into organizations and managing and owning that process. Um, the next type is the manager user. Um, the manager user generally is sort of a, a line manager or direct hiring manager. Um, they usually have less permission than a recruiter. Um, they can only see their jobs within the system as well, whereas a recruiter user can see all of the jobs unless they've opted to use the functionality for trusting another manager. And what that means is basically uh, that manager has allowed another manager, has given them trust to view those jobs. Um, you then have the agency user type. Um, so that is basically set up within your organization if you choose if you use recruitment companies um, and they're submitting candidates for your roles. So they can do that through the agency user type. Um, and then finally, of course, you've got the job seeker. So candidates who are applying to roles within your organization and using SnapFire for that. So recruiter, manager, agency, and job seeker. 
Um, what I was keen to do now is to jump through to our demo site. So I'm going to jump out of here and then go on to our demo site today, uh, which we've called DemoCo. Um, so again, this will probably look quite different, potentially depending on the setup you have for your organization. But here we come through to the main dashboard when we log in. So this is customizable depending on the admin user at your organization. Um, what you can change here is the welcome message. You can change the image here. Um, you've also got, you can put uh, solution articles or references, anything here that's gonna be useful for people using the system like yourself. Um, and then further down the bottom as well, we've also got the actions due. Now, this is really useful. Um, it will basically show you from uh, if there's any actions that need to take place from your end around candidates, things you have coming up to do or things you haven't done, you'll get reminders here about that. So really, really useful to keep an eye on that when you do come through the dashboard. Um, but basically that's the main page there. Um, coming along the top here, we've got these different tabs. Um, so we've got the jobs tab, which we'll jump into. Um, you can see here that there's a few, there's a drop down with a few different menus. There's no jobs for me here because I'm looking at my approved jobs. So for me as a user of this system, I don't have any approved jobs, but if we were to change this due to something different, so we've got my jobs or maybe my open jobs, they'll refresh and we can see that I've got one open job here. If we change it to my jobs, it's gonna show all of the jobs that I have. So some of these are incomplete, some of them might not be open, some of them will be open. Um, and so you can also refine this search uh, for a number of other criteria. So if you're looking for just your jobs or jobs for another recruiter, um, a range of other criteria that you can go through um, job family, specific keywords, uh, searching for jobs on a specific workflow. Um, and you can refine this, search for that, which is probably gonna pull up, yep, quite a few. And you can also save searches. Um, so you could save that search, call it whatever you wanted to. So we're calling it test search. Um, and then actually create that search if you want to. And then we've got test search, which will pull that through if I wanted to use that. Um, cool. Um, next up, we've got the candidates tab here. Uh, oh, I should mention as well, uh, over here, we've got the quick search. So for what I'm about to cover with the candidates and I've just covered with the jobs, um, you can also just search here with the quick bar. So if you were to search for one of those jobs, say test job, we go there and then we'll pick that up like that. So you can go to the jobs tab or you can search for it there. Um, moving on to candidates. This is a list of all the candidates within the site. Um, again, you can refine this if you're looking for someone specifically. Um, a great place to start is their name, email address, or phone number as a unique identifier. So I know that as a candidate, I've set myself up. So if I search for Carl, search now, we've got this Carl McWilliams test candidate here. So before we go into Carl's profile, a couple of things worth noting. Um, you can actually get a lot of information before you even click into this candidate's profile. So here you can see a little blue dot. Um, we've got the legend down below. What that little blue dot means is that this is an external candidate. Um, if it was to have a green dot next to them, it would be an internal candidate to so someone currently working for the organization. Um, or if it was yellow, that that candidate would have been uh, put forward in the system through an agency, through an agency candidate. Um, this legend you can basically set up and we can create other tags for you to tag candidates with. Um, and you can see here basically what the legend shows. If they've got a phone number that you can text them from, um, but we can also set up other uh, icons here for you, depending on what you need. Um, if we also have a look here, we can see Carl's applied for two jobs. Um, and we, if we click into his profile here, we can see a little bit about him, the jobs that he's applied for here, what those, role, what, what those roles were, some of the history, um, and also the information that he's provided. So he's uploaded a CV here, which you can view as a text file, which will download, or you can click on to view the original and that'll open it in a new tab. And then we've also got his profile picture there and the other information that he's put on this profile and what's going on before. So <coughs> we'll go back to the candidates here. Um, in terms of, we'll come to this a little bit later, but raising actions against candidates, probably worth mentioning, you can do it in two ways. You can use the left hand uh, menu here. So you'd need to select that candidate and then you can raise an action or you can do something to their profile with them from here um, or multiple candidates if you wanted to. 
say, for instance, if we wanted to send Carl an email, we could do that, click here and, and go through the process to do it. Or we could actually click specifically into their profile and then we have that option available as well. So this menu on the left is dynamic. It changes depending on where you are on the site and what you're doing. But just worth noting that you can, um, you can action things from the candidate's profile directly, or if you're outside of that, you need to actually select them. If I try and do something on the left here without selecting a candidate, so send email custom, it'll ask me to select it first. So it has to be selected. Uh, moving on to the marketplace. So like I touched on a little bit earlier, so SnapHire is our location tracking software. Um, the marketplace powers, sorry, uh, the Talent App Store powers that. So we can see a list of applications here in the marketplace. These are my apps on this demo co site. Um, and we've got a whole range of different applications here that you can install. Um, so if we wanted to look at just background check apps, for instance, some of you might be familiar with, with some of these, CV check or employee right. If we click into that, We've got a whole heap of information around the application, what it does. You can see here that it's currently installed on this site. Um, it's got the uninstall button now. And these places, are, uh, this information is really useful um, if you are thinking about you know, uh, adding a new application or, or something that you want, adding a new app to SnapHire. You can go in here, read up about it. There's lots of information and videos all about what they do and how they work. Um, if you go back to here, you can also explore new apps that you don't have. Um, and you can see here by the little icon whether they're installed or not, or whether they need set up. So if they've been installed but need to be configured. Um, just as a note as well, um, to be able to see the marketplace tab, it is permission based for recruiters. So you would need the managed user's permission and the permission to be able to access the marketplace as well. Okay, it's normally uh, the admin user on the site that'll have access to this. Mm, yeah. uh, and it is better to have that kind of limited to a few key people within the system. But um, definitely if you do have access to jump in and have a look, um, as Carl was just showing there, each app has its own dedicated documentation and getting started tab, which kind of goes through um, a lot of information about what it does and how mm. to also like start getting it set up. Um, and we're of course going to help with that process as well once started, but this is definitely a good place to start. Yes. Um, so feel free to go and, and have a look uh, around at that. Yeah. And usually on the get get started tab as well, there's usually a PowerPoint presentation at the bottom as well to, to show you how to install that app on um, Assessment Hub and to your workflows and uh, sorry to your jobs as well. Awesome, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Louise. Um, so if we move along a little bit further, we've got the More tab um, uh, again very permission based. So if you are able to see some of these will depend on the permissions that you're set up with in Sapphire. Um, so if we quickly go into some of these, if we have a look in the users tab, again, you can search for users using the quick search. Um, this is probably most useful for if you need to search for expired uh, users, you can refine the search and see if there's an inactive user at all and change that to just show inactive. Um, but for the most part, you probably wouldn't be going here too much. Um, we've also got the agencies tab, again, permission-based, so you may or may not be able to see this around the recruitment agencies that your organization has set up in here and some of the details around terms and conditions, that sort of thing. Um, advertising is actually quite a useful one. Um, basically, what this is, is it allows you to set up uh, your advertising tracking codes to make sure that you can track where your candidates have come from. So we do have a number of integrations with different job boards. So if you're playing, uh, if you're advertising the role on C for trainee jobs, that kind of thing. Um, but if you don't, if we don't have an integration, so if it's a small job board or particular to your industry, um, what we can do is, or what you can do, this is actually a self-service part of the site, is come through and create and manage the advertising tracking codes. So they're split into two sections, tracking codes for online media and offline media. The online media, Kind of self-explanatory, anything online, website, that kind of thing. Um, offline media, newspaper, radio, anything that's not a website essentially or job board. Um, and if we have a look at, for instance, the online media, we can see all the different sources of applications that, or all the different sources that the roles can get posted to through the site that we can then track. Um, and you can also create a new tracking code. So if I quickly just jump across uh, to a different part of the site and, and look at a job here, on the left-hand side, we've got this advertise button. If we wanted to advertise this role, so this test role that I've created, and we click on that, 
Uh, say we wanted to advertise on LinkedIn, which unfortunately we don't have an integration with, not for lack of trying. Um, you could go down to the bottom here and you can see, okay, cool, we want to build the advertisement text for uh, LinkedIn. So we click on that. And what this will do is pull through all the information about the job description. It will generate a unique job link with the job reference number and the identifier. So you can see here at the end, it's got LKD for LinkedIn. So when you do want to post this role, um, so this test role onto LinkedIn, you can copy all this information, copy in the job description and using this job link, it means that when a candidate follows that job link, the system will automatically recognize and track that they've come from LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, that's a really useful piece there, the, the advertising tab. Uh, moving along as well, again, um, admin depends on your permission settings. So some of you may or may not have access to this. Um, support uh, basically just gives a little bit of information around what version of SnapPlay you're currently running. So we're running 8640 here um, and a little bit around our support contact details as well. Um, and then finally up here, a useful one, uh, we've got the account settings here. So all about your account. So a couple of useful things that we can do here. We can see all the information that we've got, how our profile set up. Um, we've also can change a couple of things around the preferences for the site. So if we go down to theme, we can change the color theme of this, which I'll do to give you an example. If you go from honeysuckle dark to sunflower light, uh, I can change the density of the text if you want to. And another really useful thing, when I was talking about the jobs and the, the drop down menu, um, you can save a default job search here. So basically, if I pick one of these and I say that I want to see my open jobs. So whenever I come into Snapfire, the first thing that I want to see when I go into my jobs tab is my open jobs. I don't want to see my closed ones. I don't want to see ones that haven't been approved yet. I'm just working on these open positions. Um, so if we save that, what we've done is we've changed the color there it's to sunflower light. Um, and if we go to that job tab, jobs tab now, it's gone straight to my open tab, my open jobs, which can be really useful rather than having to click through here every time. Um, that's the majority of uh, tabs up the top here. Scott or Louise, have I missed anything around those ones? Yeah, no, that's good. And obviously, uh, yeah. just talking about that last bit around, um, you know, updating your default saved search, uh, you can still, of course, then come in and update each you know, on a case by case basis, still change your search and you can still refine the search to show um, any other particular variations on that you do want. So um, you can always click that refine search button um, and update your current search. Uh, and that's not going to update your default. So every time you go back to the click on the jobs tab again, it will pull up your default that's set on your account. So, mm, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Um, one other thing uh, probably worth mentioning as well that I did forget from the candidate standpoint, um, if you are searching for candidates, you can save searches here uh, from a, I suppose a talent pooling perspective. So if you are wanting to uh, look for candidates for a role and maybe you haven't advertised it yet or you think you might have good people on the, on the database for it, um, you can have saved searches. So we've got a few ones here, for instance, if we're looking for a Java developer. Um, and then what that's going to do, if we have a look at the search, um, what that has is the keyword Java saved against it. So anyone who's got Java in the resume or, or any of their details within Auckland, um, it will pull through those people. And we can see on our site here, we've got this list of people who have that Java developer or that Java word saved. Um, a couple of things about this as well. Be, you want to be careful around the settings. Um, you can get notifications if you would like, so that when there are new people potentially with niche skills, you can get a notification about that. Um, but if you set that up too broadly, depending on the number of applications that you have coming through, you might get spammed quite a bit. Um, but can be a really useful thing if you want to come in every once in a while and go, oh, I'm looking for you know, an engineer or a Java developer or whatever it is saving a search so that you can actually find some of those people quickly. Cool. Um, right, if we go back to the dashboard and then we have a look on the left-hand side, what we've got here is the menu. Uh, and what I was keen to do is create a new job and run through that process. And again, some of you might be familiar with this, but some of you might not have done that before. Um, so what I'll do is I'll click new job. And this is going to take us to the job wizard, so the job creation wizard. Um, and this is where we, basically enter all the information to create that job. So 
as you can see, it'll generate a unique reference code for the position. Um, you do have options if you want to use a template that the organization has set up. Um, so you can see we've got a couple of different templates here depending on the role that we are wanting to recruit for. Um, for this one, we are not going to use a template. I'm just going to create a new one from scratch. And then this will take us to the next one. So if we enter some test details, test job Thursday. Ooh, Thursday. Uh, employment type, selecting permanent country, there it is. Position type itself, the new or placement role. Just quickly before we go ahead on that tab. Um, yep. Ooh, okay. If you just click back onto it, yeah. Um, yeah. Just just a few things. That first that first drop down you're getting there is is going to select your workflow, and that's essentially um, it's essentially. So in this case, we've got standard, devolved, and volume, uh, and those three are each linked to either permanent, fixed term, or casual. So those um, standard, devolved, and volume are what we refer to as workflows um, in the system, and that's essentially going to decide which buckets are available on that particular workflow for that job. So, you know, you could have different buckets for the volume workflow with um, either additional or less things available and the same for, for those different workflows. Uh, and then below that, the different job families, um, th those stay on the same workflow, but they're used to control um, other details uh, like what questions get presented to a candidate at a certain part of the stage, or even what additional fields you're filling out when you actually continue to create the job. So just as a little bit of an outline of what those selections do there. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Uh, if we move on to the next part, um, so we've got job specific categories and then profile and search agent categories, which are actually different and have different uses for them. So uh, if we click show tree here, this is going to show the business group of our organization. So where this role is. So if this was an IT position, for instance, we'd select that, click OK. Um, and that's basically for our internal purposes, where this role, what department it sits within. Um, profile and search agent categories, as you can see here, uh, can be used by job, set, by job seekers, basically when they're signing up to your careers organization, they can categorize themselves with these. So for instance, if I went on to the uh, DemoCo careers website as a candidate and I registered and I said I was interested in credit control work and I lived in uh, Auckland and I was looking for a permanent full-time role. Um, when I'm creating this role, if I select the same things, we can choose to send out a notification to any candidate who has, criteria, has selected these criteria against themselves. So basically uh, it's utilizing that database of candidates that you might already have and letting them know that there's jobs that are in line with the skills that they've categorized themselves as. Um, yeah, and um, just just as a note, I guess uh, job seekers do need to opt in to say that they want to receive those alerts. Um, so it is kind of like a two way thing. They are deciding that they do want to receive them, uh, and you're also deciding if you do want to send them out. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing those prof profile search agent category parts are useful is if you do use pipeline roles. Uh, these are actually the selections that help decide uh, the filtering of candidates down to specific child jobs. So. Um, that's kind of their main, the main two functionalities behind those in the system, as well as just sort of general kind of talent pooling and, and for reference um, on what candidates expertise and locations are. Cool. Uh, so moving on to the next one, uh, we've got the advert text, so we'll just put in test ad. Um, what you can do here, if you wanted to have a slightly different ad for uh, internal candidates to see as opposed to external, you can do that. And so that when it's presented, you could have a different ad for internal staff members as opposed to external. For the purpose of this, we'll keep it the same. So we'll keep it the same ad for that. Um, and can also upload a position description uh, if you want to. Cool. And then so through the next. Just one thing with those position descriptions, which is maybe gets missed a bit sometimes is that if you want internals to also see a description, you do actually have to upload a second one in there. So if you wanted the same description to be available for externals and internals, um, you should upload it into both fields. Otherwise, if an internal is logged into an internal account, for instance, and is viewing this job, they would just not see a position description at all based on the setup. 
So if you do want them to, uh, do be sure to upload the field into both of those mm. or upload the document as both of those fields. And then there's the add media, um, advanced media at the bottom there, Carl. So if you click on show content here, you can actually add in embedded videos. So that could be of your organization of what the role's about or anything like that. So that's quite handy to have as well. It does need to be embedded though. So it's yeah. kind of a little bit trickier, but if you go onto YouTube and use the embed option, it gives you a um, embed sort of an, the link. A little um, embedded iframe piece that you can copy and paste directly in there and that'll work. So YouTube works really well for that, but other platforms should also have a way to do that. Um, if you do have any trouble, let us know and we can we can help out where needed. Okay. Next up, we've got the questions tab. So this is going to show the questions that are going to be asked of uh, any candidates that are applying to this job. Um, because we haven't used a template, uh, there's only a couple of questions that are actually going to get asked. There's not a huge amount of information. But if we were using one of those templates, it would be pulling through a pre-formatted list of questions to be asked specifically for that role. So I saw some of the different role types before. Um, but you can also add questions in here if you'd like to. Um, add a specific question, select what you'd like to add uh, for, this, for those candidates to answer. Um, and then you can also see here uh, whether it would be viewed or asked of external staff members, so external uh, candidates, internal candidates, or again, agency, um, because you may not need all of these questions to be asked for an internal candidate as opposed to an external. If you just scroll down a bit there, um, this is actually something that's quite useful. If you are planning on adding uh, your own questions to jobs, firstly, do note that that will only add question for the specific job. Um, so we have a default job question list in the back end that can be used to update the defaults. Uh, but down the bottom here, you've got the try these questions out. Um, you don't need to click on that now, Carl, but if, um, if you are adding new questions in, uh, I do suggest clicking on one of those. It'll actually open up like a, like a preview of the ad on the careers page and you can click apply and actually get a bit of an idea of what your new question you've, you've added looks like uh, and where it sits compared to the other questions and things like that. So uh, a really good way to kind of see what that's going to look like before the candidates have the opportunity to see it, um, just so you know you've done it right. Oh, moving along, we've got uh, whether the job's el eligible for a referral, uh, which to be honest, I think not a huge amount of our, our clients use. And we're going to go not eligible for this role. And then you can upload an image if you'd like to. Um, so we don't have one attached at the moment. There's a couple of different places that you can upload an image from. Um, so you can do it specifically from your computer and find a file there. We have this um, a company image. Um, or you can also uh, put a URL in here, upload one from the internet, or you can go from the image gallery on the site. So if we have a look here, select image, this is this takes us through to the site gallery for our demo co site. And so we can pick any of these images. So if we pick accountant three, okay, that will upload our image from the demo co site gallery. Moving through, um, these last tabs, again, are uh, very configurable and uh, are not the default. So your setup may not have all of these ones that we'll go through here, but um, you can set a hiring manager for the role. So I'll set our hiring manager as the hiring manager for this position. Um, and you can also see the recruiter for this role. And if you want to have any other additional managers on the role, so that, like I mentioned earlier, they can see this role if they're helping out in that recruitment process. So additional manager is quite a cool functionality. It's very similar to the trust we mentioned earlier. So it's essentially giving um, an extra manager access to a role, even though they aren't the direct manager on that role, uh, which can be useful for things if, uh, you know, you've got some job sharing going on or if one of your managers is going away and needs somebody else to look at the role. Um, and th but this in this way, you can set it on a role by role basis instead of giving one manager access to all of another manager's roles. So both those options are available in different places. As Carl was saying, these next few tabs here, um, everything we've looked at to up till now through this form is, is, is pretty hard coded and most of you, most people will have that depending on the permissions you've got. Uh, but these next few tabs, <laughs> your own ones for your company will have been built specifically for you. Uh, and so if you do have any questions around the content on those, uh, it's worth um, talking internally about that because it would have been requested by your company at some point. 
it's no longer relevant, uh, let us know. We can change those for you. If there's additional stuff you need added, uh, let us know as well. We can make sure that that gets in. Thanks, Scott. So let's just go through this really quickly, fill out the yeah. mandatory stuff. And... Cool. So, so I will get an email, one position. Da, 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 da. So you don't need to fill in any of the kinds of them. It's not mandatory. Cool. And then basically save and finish to actually create our job. Um, so what we'll do is we'll save and finish. And then what that's done now is created our job. Now, a couple of things to be aware of. If you have a look down here, the status of the job is currently in waiting for approval. Um, and there's a number of different uh, statuses that you can have um, that will change based on the left-hand menu here. So in waiting for approval, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but uh, can anything actually happen with the job in terms of um, putting can a candidate supplying or, or doing anything with it yet at this point? No. So, I mean, essentially at that point, you're you're going to be building a chain and waiting for people to come through and approve it based on some pre-selected information that will come up in that view. One thing to note is that we set this up, um, this demo site up as a way to show what's kind of possible at the job creation stage. So in this case, at the moment, the job was created and went directly into waiting for approval. That's actually probably not the more common way it happens. Um, what might be happening on your site is once the job has been created, it will be in draft. Uh, and then you can submit it for approval when ready. It really depends on how you're doing it. What we can sometimes, uh, what, we, what we found is putting something like this in place is if managers are creating the roles and you want it to go straight into waiting for approval and send an email to the recruiter to let them know to come in and build the chain or start the chain, uh, that, then that's possible. Um, but yes, a lot of the time that submit for approval might be a manual action through that change status menu on the left. Yes, cool. And just in terms oh. of the different statuses that we do have, um, a number of different ones around open, visible to all, basically that is open and, and visible for candidates to see on the careers website, um, visible external only, only people who are external to the organization will be able to see it. Uh, visible internal only, the opposite of that. Um, open not visible means that it will be open here on the system, but not on the career site. So you can still kind of play around with that and do things you need to. And that's maybe one to touch on just a little bit more. The open not visible, once a, once a, um, a job closes off the career site, uh, that's the status it goes back into. So open not visible is essentially saying you're still processing candidates through it, but it's not being advertised, which is different to closed, which is somebody's been hired, everything's done, uh, you know, everybody's been either hired or screened out and the job's been closed down. Yes, cool. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, and so if we, for the purpose of making this pull through to our career site, if we change this to open and visible to all, we'll go through and do that. Uh, now, the application closed date and time. So this is, got, I think this is the time that it will get pulled down from the career site. Is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. that's the at the point it will get changed to open, not visible. So we'll a couple of months away for that. Um, and then where we were talking about alerting the talent pool, so people who would have categorized their skills when they found up on the website, um, you can then choose to whether or not you want to send out an email to people who are matching this profile. So for this job, we don't want to do that, but if we had selected yes here uh, and we click okay, someone would then get an email if they had the skills that we'd uh, categorized for this job, saying, hey, there's a new job, first job Thursday. <laughs> Uh, that matches your skills, have a look at it here. We're gonna go no on this occasion. And so now, as you can see, that status has changed to open. And if we go to our demo code careers site, which is here, and then if we have a look at all jobs, we can see test job Thursday, CNCW. Cool. And that's pulled through our ad, a very brief ad, um, and the details for this position. So if we jump back into Democo, um, because we've just opened that job, we obviously don't have any applications for this yet. So luckily there are some jobs I prepared earlier that do have applications. Um, so if we go to the cleaner test role, what we can see here is that we've got uh, one candidate here in the incoming bucket. So all of these different headings here are buckets that a candidate can be moved in or out of. So there's a candidate in this bucket, and from this point, we can move them into other buckets. Um, it is worth noting that if the bucket 
text is underlined, then that's what we call a terminal bucket. And that means that all the candidates in this job need to be in a terminal bucket before it can be closed. So at the moment, we wouldn't be able to close this job because we've got one candidate in the incoming bucket. Uh, to close this job, we would need to have them in either the screened out bucket, the withdrawn bucket, or the hired bucket, because we want to be getting back to people and letting them know what the status of the application is. So that's a really good way that we've kind of safeguarded against that. So if we have a look at this candidate, so if we click on the one here, we can see that it's uh, Carl test candidate we've gotten here um, in this incoming bucket. So if we click through and have a look at Carl, we want to view their CV. Oh, Carl's got a great CV. We really like the look of him. Um, great ID and profile as well. Um, we can also, like I was going through, see some of their previous history. Um, but say we wanted to move Carl to a phone screen. So what we'll do is we can go down to here to initial review, click on that, and then we can go to move to phone screen or record phone screen. Um, so if we have a conversation with Carl, we can either move him into this bucket first, and then we have the option to record it. We've got the information here, use this action to move the application to the phone screen bucket. And it tells you here that raising this action against the candidate has no other effects. So it just moves them into that bucket. So say we said, uh, Carl and I, I have a great chat. And click OK. We can now see that we don't have any candidates in that incoming bucket. So what's happened is we've, uh, we've raised the action against Carl that we wanted to do a phone screen. We've added the phone screen notes from that and now is moved from the incoming bucket to the phone screen. So that's why we can't see him here. So to go and look at his profile again now, we'll click on the one in the phone screen and we can see the last action here is completed, moved to phone screen and then we've got a little summary here. Carl and I had a great chat. And again, we can see how many roles Carl's applied for. And we've got a little bit of information here as well. Um, but yeah, moving from that first link in the bucket to phone screen. Um, I'll go through maybe a little bit more, but again, this workflow and this process will likely look very different for everyone's organization specifically. Um, so it's probably not worth going and moving Carl into all of these different buckets. But um, if we did want to, for instance, yeah. then decide. Let's maybe, sorry, just hold here for one second, Carl. Um, yeah, one good thing uh, Carl was just pointing out was the different columns that you're seeing here while you're looking at the phone screen bucket. So this is what we call a bucket view. Um, and it just essentially decides what columns of information you're going to be able to see in this list view. So if you imagine you had 10 candidates sitting in this bucket, you didn't want to have to see, um, you know, maybe you'd actually had it said that this job was for Auckland and you'd said it was for across the North Shore and you wanted to see or across the North Island, you wanted to see which locations people had selected. You could add in the location column here and that way you could look at it in a list view and see that information without having to click into each candidate. So those bucket views are editable. That's something you can edit yourself as an admin user or you can um, talk to us and we can do that for you or help you through it if you want to do it yourself with some help. Um, and it just means you can set up each bucket to show information that's relevant to that stage, uh, which can be very, very useful. Um, if you're finding you're spending a lot of time clicking into each candidate to see something specific and then going into a next one. So that might be something that's really useful um, at that point. The other thing uh, that you might notice is that the um, application menu on the left, as Carl mentioned before, that changes depending on what you're looking at. So now as we go from bucket to bucket, the actions that are available on that menu will change based on which bucket you're in. And that's something that can be set on a site-by-site, -site, action by action basis. So if you've got an action currently and you're going, oh, I wish that was available from the manager review bucket, let us know and we can make sure that that becomes available. And in the same way, if there's actions available from a bucket that are irrelevant and just taking up space for no reason, they can be removed. So that's, um, yeah, very customizable there on what shows up at which points. Cool. Thanks, Scott. That's a great point. Um, so we've had our phone screen with uh, with Carl, and we've decided that we want to maybe move him to a first interview. Um, so what we'll do is we'll select him. We'll go interview, first interview, and you can see we've got a number of different options here. Uh, so we've got schedule and edit details, ask the candidate to confirm, send details to candidate, to agency, to manager. So this will really depend, again, on your process and how you want to use the system and, and how your site is set up. 
Um, for Carl, what I want to do is I want to schedule the details for an interview with him. So I'm going to click on that button. And that's going to bring up the page here where it asks me for a, a range of information. So first interview date and time, you can use the picker here and say, let's have an interview with Carl on Saturday at midnight, which I'm sure he'll love. Um, we can then choose who's going to be the participant for that. So we'll go to the test manager uh, location, say test location, one, two, three, fake street. Um, and then if we click OK, what that's going to do is record those details against Carl's application. And it's also, again, as you can see, it's now moved Carl from the phone screen bucket to the first interview bucket. So if we click here to have a look again, um, we can see Carl's application now in the first interview bucket. Now, at this point, Carl hasn't actually received these details. We've just logged them in the system. So what I'm going to do now, now that I've actually organized this, so interviews, first interview, and I want to send these details to the candidate. I want Carl to receive this information. I'll click on that. And what we're going to get is a template, a templated email, again, that would have been set up for your organization, saying hi. Now, these place markers here, the at at, are going to pull through information uh, based on Carl's profile. So to start with, we've got the subject here, interview details for test, CNCW Prima test. And then we've got this code here. So uh, if you change any of the details within the at at, you will break the link in terms of what it needs to pull through. So just worth being aware of that. Um, they may look and read funny, but what they'll do is actually pull through the, the right information to send to the candidate. So this one here is going to pull through the interview uh, time. Um, and so here, JS first name, that's gonna pull through Carl's name when we send out this email. Um, and then here we've got the date and time, the participants and the location. So all of that information that we just previously entered um, is now logged against Carl's application. And when we send this email, it's going to pull through into here and send that out. So if you do want to change anything in this email as well, say you wanted to add some other notes about um, reception, it was hard to find. You can do that depending on how your email templates are set up. You can have a mix of setting up your templates as either editable or not, or depending on whatever action it is. Um, so yeah, it basically again comes down to your organization and how you want to do that. But if we want to send this, we can see it's going to Carl or go to his email address that we've got in the system. Um, now we've also got down here the iCalendar as well. Um, Scott, could you touch on that a little bit as well? Yeah, so I mean, not everybody will have this set up um, automatically, but we can, you know, send an iCal attachment um, with these sorts of emails. They're not fully integrated or anything like that, so it's not overly. It's maybe not that useful from a user perspective when, say, if you were sending out to another manager, because they're not going to be able to like book that directly into their calendar along with rooms and things like that. Um, but for candidates, it can be really handy, so they can just click to add it to their calendar and that way it's in whichever calendar they're using. Um, so that can be handy, but once again, controlled on an action by action basis. Um, the other thing which Kyle just touched on there, which was around the, being able to edit the emails. So a good example of that is we might have a um, the same interview email, the same interview action, but two different versions, one for recruiters, one for managers. We might make the recruiter version editable and have the manager version non-editable, just so that there's no chance of them breaking those placeholders like we mentioned. So those are the kinds of things we can also do if you want some users, um, like one set of users, managers, to not be able to edit, but for your recruiters to be able to, uh, which is often the case because um, organizations like recruiters that have quite a bit of flexibility within the system. And so we'll click OK and send out that email to Carl. Cool. And then we can see. Well, while we're looking at this, actually, maybe let's just quickly touch on um, the assessment hub piece here. So you may have noticed we've got this assessment hub tray showing up on the right here. Um, and this is all linked up to the Snapfire marketplace. So if you have um, certain apps installed and you know, normally assessment apps, or it could be um, checking apps like CV check or reference checking apps, um, you can map them so that they show up in certain workflows in certain buckets. So you can say, you know, maybe at the, a very common place you might see this is the pre-employment checks button. 
uh, where you might be uh, doing reference checks using a third party. And so this is the little interface that allows you to do that easily. You would click on one of those, maybe just click on the weirdly one as a start. I don't know how set up it is on, on the site, but yeah, essentially you get something like this where it says start assessment uh, and there's going to be a pre, like a, when you first set this up, we help set up um, a list of information that gets sent off to the third party. And when you click start assessment, yeah, essentially it sends that all off, lets the third party do their piece, and then the information will come back and present itself back in this box here. Um, so just a really handy way to get somebody else to help out with something and get the information to come back to, to the same place. So um, that's what that, that all is. And uh, if you don't already have that set up, I wanna have a look at that. As I said, do have a look at the marketplace tab uh, and let us know if you need any help at all. We're happy to help go through new setups there. Awesome, um, thank you. Unless you have any other suggestions, Scott, I'm keen to uh, decline Carl for this role. Would it be worth doing any other buckets? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, yeah, I guess maybe we would quickly touch on some of the other buckets, the waiting for approval, not approved, approved. That's a kind of sort of hard coded piece in the system. It's just whether you want to do higher approval. It works similar to the job approval where you move them into the first status, you choose who you want the panelists to be, either that or if you have a solidly set up um, internal uh, structure of approvers that never changes, we can actually have that automatic. Um, and then once they're approved, we'll be able to go through to the offer and onboarding stage. The onboarding stage is maybe the next most interesting bit. Um, so what, once again, we have third parties through, through the um, marketplace that can do onboarding. Um, otherwise, we do have our own sort of um, internal onboarding piece where a candidate logs in and they get presented with a list of buttons uh, and they uh, complete those, which allows them to upload documents and, um, you know, accept declarations and things like that. So often tax information or um, IOD, you know, IOD and KiwiSaver and things like that, it's all captured at that stage. So when the candidate sitting in the onboarding in, in progress bucket, they would get an email follow a link and they'll actually log into the site and complete some stuff that'll update automatically in the system. So that's quite useful. We've just had a question there um, from Dan um, asking if we can place, uh, can we you place directly into a pre-employment check bucket from the first interview? Uh, Carl, do you want to try that? But um, it's pretty, it depends on how your system is set up. Um, it is pretty configurable, but if that is something that's not set up on your site at the moment and you would like that to happen, just uh, send us through an email to hello at and we can have that discussion with you and make that available. Definitely. So that's one of those things that are, you know, very customizable in the system. If you want somebody to be able to move to a particular bucket from a particular bucket, uh, we can make that available. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Um, great. Well, if we are thinking about Carl and we, he has this first interview and he does really, really poorly and we decide that he's not going to unfortunately get the job and we want to decline him, we go to the decline on the side. Now, you'll have a range of different options here depending on what you want to do. You can see you've got here with no message or if you want him to decline someone who's not online, so a postal candidate, or you can move him to the decline later bucket where again, you'll need to um, basically decline them later, but you don't need to do that now. Um, you can also select where this is coming from, whether it's coming from uh, you directly as a user or from the organization in general. Um, so say if we want to reject Carl, and look, he has come in for an interview with us, which is good, um, but if we want to reject him and say, what was the reason? Top talent. It basically shows you the email that he will get sent the thanks for your application. Unfortunately, we're not going any forward further uh, to the next stage. However, keep an eye on our website for the employer in future. Um, you can also select a reason for why he was screened out. So maybe he didn't impress during the interview uh, or during the screening. So turned up wearing jeans or something. Um, and then any other notes if you want to add in here. Um, so not seen by the candidate, but good to keep in mind if you do you know, maybe it wasn't a, a really, really bad interview. Maybe it was just that uh, slightly too junior or something like that. So you can actually make a note of that. So if you're looking at Carl's profile in future for roles, you can see he was good, just slightly too junior for this position. And just yeah. as a note, candidates cannot see this information at all. <laughs> uh, cool. And then so we'll send that out to Carl. And you can now see he's moved to the screened out bucket. So that terminal bucket there. See him sitting in that one there. Cool. 
I mean, we've got the note there slightly too junior. So that in the future, if we do go back and see, we've got all this information about what we've, uh, the process we've had with our own class. Cool. Um, in terms of this job, uh, it is good practice. Um, so if we were to say that, look, we interviewed Carl, it didn't work out, and then we weren't actually hiring this role anymore, we, we don't want to have the role anymore, we can close it. Um, you can then archive this job as well so that it doesn't come through into your, your jobs list. Um, so if we change the status of this role now to archived, not visible. Yeah, archived is a good um, status to be aware of. If you have any jobs that you've created an error or they're double laps or that you created them as a test job, do feel free to do that if you want to have a play around. As long as you're not opening a job and making it visible on the career site, people aren't going to be able to apply for it. So if you just want to kind of play around with the, the job wizard, um, you know, that's not going to break anything. And as long as you archive the job afterwards, it keeps it out of reporting, it keeps it out of all your standard lists, and it just kind of helps keep things tidy. Um, so we do recommend doing that for those for those kinds of roles that aren't real and haven't been recruited against. So we will do that here. You see now, oh, hold on. Yeah. Why isn't that it's gone to a different job because your other one's not oh, in that status. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool, so if we go to the drop down here and then go under archive jobs, we can see here that this is uh, the job that we've just archived. You can see the files in that, in that bucket there. Excellent. Um, that is basically the majority of I suppose, some of the um, basic functionality around Snap Hire and the tabs here and the menu and creating the role. Um, Scott or Louise, was there anything else? You yeah, thought? maybe just look into one of those jobs there, quick, Carl. We'll talk about the, um, just very quickly about this candidate buttons um, or some of these widgets on the right here. Mm -hmm. So on the right hand side, you'll see this candidate buttons widget. This links back to our, um, our app in the marketplace, which is called SwitchGet. Um, and it's essentially the app that allows you to control what buttons a candidate seeing when they go to the site. So there'll be um, a default across the whole site, but you can also then change it on a job by job basis. For instance, if you click edit there, Carl, we've got two sections, a visible and a hidden section. So any app that's been installed will show up here. So simple apply is a good example. So simple apply is an apply method uh, where all you're asking for is email address and password, as well as I believe a first name, last name, and a CV. So what we find uh, a lot of our clients are using that for is maybe internal applications. You, you're essentially just wanting like an expression of interest from your internals rather than a full application. So they're not going to get asked all of your registration and job questions, uh, but they will be able to put an application through. Um, so what what you could do in that case is if you click across to internal there, Carl. Say that again, sorry, Scott. If you click on the internal tab at the top there, what we could do is drag the simple apply one from hidden into visible. And then we would drag and hit OK. And then we would want to drag the total apply one down back into hidden because you wouldn't want two different apply buttons on your job. And so now we would, if we click edit again, that'll lock it down. And we've actually got simple apply now for internals, but the regular apply method for externals. So you can have a kind of mix up like that. And that's all dependent on what you've got installed and, and want to make available. So. Um, Quite a bit of flexibility around what you can present to candidates at that point. Uh, another good example is the redirect button there. Um, it could be an example where you want to redirect candidates that click apply somewhere else rather than get them to apply directly into the system. It's not very common, but some people use it quite effectively. Uh, and what you would do is get rid of all of your apply buttons and instead you would click on that redirect button and it'll give you an option to put a URL in there. So when somebody clicks apply, they'll go to the URL that you put in there instead of going to the apply form. Uh, so a few different things you can do with the candidate buttons there. Let's scroll down a little bit there. Uh, another good example is Seek. If you use Seek, you've probably seen this before, but essentially once the job, um, it's not gonna allow it yet because the job is not in the right status. But once a job is open and visible to at least externals, uh, you'll have the option to post to Seek. And what that's gonna do is pre-populate a Seek form with as much information as possible. And then there'll be a few sort of seek specific fields that you'll still need to fill out at that point. Uh, and that'll post it through to seek, but keep the link to the job in Snapfire. So you'll be able to see the posting here when it expires uh, and things like that. Um, and your candidates will come through uh, to the job automatically sourced as coming from seek. So uh, it's just a really nice kind of 
easy way to do it without having to leave the system. Mm. I suppose as well. Oh. As well, yeah. Sorry, Luke, that's okay. I was going to say, um, just to be careful as well. If you um, do have your close date for your job, but you want to close it a bit earlier, that will also affect Seek as well. Seek as well. So that job will come down from Seek. So just as an FYI, yeah. that's right. Because you can't have a job open on Seek um, if it's not open on Snapi, because the application needs somewhere to redirect back to. Mm -hmm. uh, let's maybe talk about the unlisted link lastly. Uh, so this unlisted link is really useful. Um, if you've got the top little tick box ticked on, that essentially means you're allowing unlisted links for this job. So if you untick it now, um, you'll see that com compacted. So ticking it on allows unlisted links to be used. And what that means is you can send that link in the blue box out to a candidate uh, and they'll be able to apply for the role even if it's no longer being advertised. Definitely still recommend that the job is in open status, but just not visible if you send this out. Uh, a good example is somebody may have said, ah, oh, I saw the job and I was halfway through an application, uh, but then it closed. If you're still happy for them to be able to apply, you can send them that link uh, and they'll be able to get around that. Now, the thing to note is if you click that link, up, yep. once the link loads and you're seeing this page, the URL is actually slightly different now. So the URL at the top there in the address bar is different from what was on the back end. You need to make sure you are sending the one directly from that blue box to the candidate. If you click it yourself and send them the link from that page, uh, that won't work as it has a session stored against it and it will know that it hasn't come directly from the unlisted link. So just something yeah. to keep in mind, but the unlisted link is can be really useful. Um, another example might be is maybe you've opened a job and you already have a candidate in mind who you'd like to apply. You could send them the unlisted link, allow them to apply for the job without actually opening it to the public. Mm -hmm. And then if it reaches a point where that candidate doesn't work out, you can still open the job to the public after that. And you won't have to create multiple roles or anything like that. So uh, it can be very useful. The last thing to note there is that regenerate button. What the regenerate button does is it changes the link uh, into a new link and it breaks it for anybody who has the old one. So if you wanted to give people a week to use the link and after that, you don't want them to be able to use it anymore, you can click regenerate breaks all the old links and you've got a new one that you could send out if there was some new people you wanted to send it to. Cool. I think that's just about it. Um, if anybody has any questions, we'll stick around for another uh, few minutes uh, to answer any of those. Otherwise, thank you very much, everybody. We will send a follow-up email as mentioned with links to our, um, some documentation into our YouTube uh, channel where we've got uh, a range of these um, webinars uploaded. This exact one might not be up there, but we will definitely make sure we have a new recruiter one up there and we'll keep that refreshed as anything new starts to come up um, as we do these webinars. So thank you for attending everybody and uh, hope you all have a great day. Thanks very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks. We've just had a question come through from Lisa asking if a recruiter can customize buckets. Um, that is a request that you would send through to us um, and we would have that conversation with you around the bucket changes and what you would actually like. It, SnapHire is very configurable, so um, you can have the buckets in as any order as you like, but um, yeah, feel free to send through an email to hello at AOTO, um, and we can have that discussion with you. In terms of customizing the buckets, I guess quite quite a broad question, but some of the other things we can do with buckets is, um, you know, we can update the instruction bit at the top and there's quite a lot we can do there. We can, we can do pretty much anything that can be done with HTML, which means mm. we can make things colorful, we can make them large, we can have some big font there. Yeah. If you really want to make something obvious, um, we could also add in links to videos or even have videos embedded so you can watch them directly there. Uh, another useful thing, that we can have in those bucket instruction um, sections is um, links to uh, maybe like templates. It might be like a good example is maybe phone like screen a template yeah. or phone screening template, or it could just be to um, if it's a bucket that your managers are using, it could be a link to internal uh, manager 
information of some sort. Yeah. So yeah, we can do we can do quite a lot there. Okay, well, I think that looks like it might be it. So um, thank you much. Thank you very much, everybody. And have a great day. Thank you. See you later.